Welcome back. This time in our Concepts of Biology book, we are looking at Chapter 20, Ecosystems and the Biosphere, continuing our studies of ecology. Our next slide gives us our objectives for the four sections that we'll be covering during this chapter. Energy flow through ecosystems, biogeochemical cycles, and then we'll talk about some different biomes, such as terrestrial biomes and aquatic and marine biomes. Ecology. Putting it all together, it's the study of interactions between creatures and their environment, because everything is connected to everything else. In our introduction, we learn that ecosystem ecology our study for this week is an extension of organismal population and community ecology. We've already studied population and community ecology, while organismal biology is just study of single organisms. But now we're going to study the whole ecosystem, how everything in an ecosystem is interconnected. An ecosystem includes both the biotic and abiotic components. Biotic means living, and abiotic means non-living. And an ecosystem then would be in a geographic area. Some examples of abiotic items that are non-living include air, water, soil, and climate. And some examples of biotic components of an ecosystem are the animals, the bacteria, the plant life, the fungi, and other decomposers and such. Ecosystem biology, biologists study how nutrients and energy are stored and moved among organisms and the surrounding atmosphere, soil, and water. What is an ecosystem? It's a community of living organisms and their abiotic or non-living environment and how they all interact together. The sizes of ecosystems vary. Some examples include the tide pools found near the rocky shores of many oceans to something even bigger, the tropical rainforest of the Amazon in Brazil. Three broad categories of ecosystems based on their general environment include freshwater ecosystems, marine, and terrestrial ecosystems. Terrestrial means on uh, the earth, on the land. Within these three categories are individual ecosystem types based on the environment, environmental habitat, and the organisms that are present within that ecosystem. Here's an example of that tidal pool we were just talking about, and the tropical rainforest in Brazil. The ecology of ecosystems. Ecosystem dynamics involve competition for the limited resources that are within the ecosystem, including things that organisms need like food, water, sunlight, space, and mineral nutrients. It's influenced by the habitat's physical environment, such as the climate, what elevation the ecosystem is at, its geology, and it helps determine then which organisms can actually in exist in this particular area. So one example of an ecosystem is freshwater ecosystems, and these tend to be the least common here on Earth, making up only about 1.8% of our Earth and include lakes, rivers, streams, and springs. They do support a diversity of organisms. Marine ecosystems, those are saltwater ecosystems, are 75% of the Earth, so much more common than the freshwater type. They consist of three basic types, including the shallow ocean, deep ocean water, and deep ocean bottom. Shallow ocean ecosystems include extremely biodiverse coral reef ecosystems. The deep ocean water is known for large numbers of plankton and krill and other small crustaceans that support it. Both of these are important to aerobic respirators worldwide. These are organisms who need oxygen, and phytoplankton perform about 40% of all photosynthesis here on Earth. Remember that photosynthesis is the act of taking carbon dioxide out of the air, along with water, and then using sunlight to make 
both sugar in the form of glucose and oxygen. And that helps all of us aerobic respirators worldwide who need that oxygen. Deep ocean bottom ecosystems contain a wide variety of marine organisms and exist even at depths where light is unable to penetrate through the water. Then there's the terrestrial ecosystems, which are definitely known for their diversity. And these are grouped into large categories called biomes. A biome is a large scale community of organisms primarily defined on land by the dominant plant types that exist there in these geographic regions and similar climatic conditions. Some examples are tropical rainforests, savannas, deserts, grasslands, temperate forests, and tundras. And they have a great deal of diversity of ecosystems within each biome. So a biome can be made up of different ecosystems. We'll talk about some specific biomes at the end of our chapter. Here's some examples with the desert ecosystems. Ecosystems and disturbances. Ecosystems have many, many interacting and complex parts. And of course, they're routinely exposed to disturbances. These are changes in the environment that affect composition, such as yearly rainfall and temperature can change and cause a disturbance, or a forest fire definitely causes a disturbance. And then, of course, there's the human impacts, like agriculture pollution, acid rain, and deforestation that can cause disturbances as well. And it's all part of a particular process that we studied in our last chapters called succession, which includes predictable changes that happen to an ecosystem over time. Equilibrium is a dynamic state of an ecosystem in which, despite the changes in the species numbers and occurrence, biodiversity remains somewhat constant. An equilibrium, kind of balanced. And two parameters are used to measure changes in ecosystem. Those two parameters are called resilience and resistance. So let's look at resistance first. The ability of an ecosystem to remain at equilibrium despite disturbances that occur. And resilience, the speed at which an ecosystem recovers back to the equilibrium state after being disturbed. Human impacts, we should note, can disturb an ecosystem beyond resistance and resilience, leading to a complete ecosystem destruction and irreversible altering. So now, since we're talking ecosystem ecology, let's talk food chains. This is usually a topic that many people are familiar with. A food chain is a linear sequence of organisms, basically what we call feeders, in which nutrients pass from one organism to the next as one organism eats the next one. And they would include these feeding relationships. All, eat, or all food chains would start with the sun. That's where it gets its primary energy from, the ultimate source of energy on Earth. And the first level of all food chains would be plants or producers. They have the green chlorophyll to do photosynthesis to take that sun's energy and transform it into oxygen and into glucose. And then we have our next level, which generally are our what are called primary consumers, which consist of herbivores that eat the plants or the producers. Our next level up contains our secondary consumers, generally, which might be carnivores, which eat meat, or it could also be omnivores, which eat both plants and meat. Our tertiary consumers, level four, are our top carnivores. And all levels then would connect, as we see with the arrows, to our decomposers who help to recycle it all when it's all said and done. The top level feeders up here, our tertiary consumers, are called our apex consumers. Sometimes we also have a a next level called quaternary consumers, but a ecosystem has to be very healthy and diverse and rich in order to get to that many levels of consumers in a food chain. 
Here's some trophic levels. A trophic level is a feeding level of a food chain in Lake Ontario. This one's located at the Canada border with the United States. Energy and nutrients flow from the photosynthetic green algae, the producers at the base, to the top of the food chain, the apex predator, the Chinook salmon. This food chain goes up to the tertiary feeder. Here's a little reminder of our equation for photosynthesis. It never hurts to refresh, refresh our memories of that equation. Carbon dioxide and water with light energy makes glucose and oxygen gas, which all of us aerobic respirators really appreciate. And we appreciate the uh, glucose as well for food. Now one thing that must be noted is the cost of living that all food chains can only have so many levels because only so much energy is actually transferred to the next level. Some of the energy is actually lost. It can be lost in the form of heat and cellular respiration that the organism here chewing on the plant is going to use some of that for cellular, cellular respiration. Some will be dis dissipated as heat as well. So putting that food into its own energy, some of it will be excreted in its waste. Those are energy components that are lost to daily living. Some of it uh, then maybe about 10%, usually this one says 17%, but generally on average only about 10% goes into the organism's tissues, which then that's what moves to the next level on the food chain. Each of the levels here is called a trophic level. Producers is a trophic level, a feeding level, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and the apex predators, the tertiary consumers. Notice how each level, each trophic level, um, has less mass as we go up, less biomass, and less energy available to them. So our producers have to support everybody above them. Here's another example of both a terrestrial food chain and a marine food chain. This one, both of these actually go up to the quaternary consumer level, meaning that it's probably a very rich ecosystem to be able to support that. Again, only about 10% of the energy is transferred to the next trophic level. Here's an example of what is actually more likely that you would find in an ecosystem. Since a food chain is a linear sequence of trophic levels, meaning it just goes from one to the next, what you would probably most likely find, or what's more realistic, is called food web instead, like we see here. But it still consists of the different trophic levels with our apex predators here on the top, even though this one contains humans as well, you'll note that the arrow goes towards whatever is getting the energy. So for instance, the elephant seal here is receiving energy by eating the fish, and the sperm whale is receiving energy by eating the squid. So a food web is a concept that accounts for the multiple trophic or feeding interactions between each species and the many species it may feed on or that may feed on it itself. So there's many feeding connections within an ecosystem often. And a food web is much more realistic than a food chain. This food web shows the interactions between organisms across different trophic levels here. Again, the organisms point from the organism that's consumed to the organism that consumes it. All the producers and consumers eventually become nourishment for the decomposers here. Even though we put the decomposers at the bottom, in the end, they get to feed on everybody and recycle those nutrients 
back to the ecosystem to be used again. Decomposers include organisms like fungi, mold, earthworms, bacteria, and even insects as well at times. So we can say energy can flow through an ecosystem from the sun to our producers, which includes plants and algae and cyanobacteria, which then goes to herbivores or primary consumers, to secondary consumers or carnivores, to the tertiary, to the quaternary if they exist in that ecosystem, but also realizing that at each level there is a loss of energy that's dissipated and only about 10% gets transferred to the next level. And this slide helps to reflect that energy numerically of what is available to begin with, with joules, that's what J stands for, joules of sunlight. If there were a million joules of sunlight, then that would transfer to our primary producers. There would be 10,000 joules available for them, and then 1,000 joules available for the primary consumers, 100 joules available for the secondary consumers, and 10 joules for the tertiary consumers, our apex predators. And over here is then the number of organisms that can be supported. So if we can have this many, is that a billion plants? We can have that many, then we can only have 100,000 primary consumers and then we can only have a hundred secondary consumers, which all of those organisms can only support one tertiary consumer. So this is why you can only have so many of our top level feeders. There's just not enough energy in an ecosystem to support more than that. In an ecosystem, you can't have a million lions and then only have a hundred thousand primary consumer herbivores, there just wouldn't be enough energy to support them. So your apex predators, your tertiary and quaternary consumers, you're only ever going to have a small amount of those in an ecosystem. Because again, the energy decreases as you go up the food chain or up the food web, or actually what is a uh, more realistic is kind of a feeding pyramid as you see here. That the base is wide, meaning there's a lot of energy at the base for a lot of numbers of organisms, but it gets smaller as we get to the top and uh, scrunches in and we have room for less of those organisms due to less energy at the top. So we make it more of a pyramid. And this diagram shows this as well with the amount of energy in a, in a pyramid style from the bottom feeders, the producers, to the primary consumers, meaning that there's only 10% of energy that transfers to each level. And by the time we get up to our tertiary consumers, there's only so much energy left. That's why you have to have a really, really rich ecosystem to get up to even another level yet, which would be quaternary consumers. Types of food webs. There's two general types of food webs, often shown interacting in a single ecosystem, such as a grazing food web. This has plants or other photosynthetic organisms at the base, followed by your herbivores and your various carnivores. There's also the detrial food web, consisting of a base of organisms that feed on decaying dead organic matter, including decomposers that break down that dead and decaying uh, matter, and detritivores, which consume organic detrius. So bacteria, fungi, invertebrate animals, they do the recycling of the organic material back into the biotic part of the ecosystem as they themselves are consumed by other organisms as well. And as ecosystems require a method to recycle material from dead organism, uh, grazing food webs also have an associated detrial food web. So everything basically goes back to our decomposers. How organisms acquire energy in a food web. Energy input is required, obviously. 
and food web diagrams can illustrate how energy flows directionally through ecosystems. It's acquired in two ways. From autotrophs, who actually harness that uh, energy from the sun. They harness light and convert it to chemical energy in the form of sugar, glucose. So this is photosynthetic, or photoautotrophs, who use sunlight as their energy source, like plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria, like cyanobacteria, otherwise called blue-green algae. There's also chemosynthetic organisms, also called chemoautotrophs, Trophs who use inorganic molecules as an energy source. There are certain bacteria and archaebacteria, archaea, that are found in rare ecosystems where you don't find light. The light doesn't penetrate that far. And so places like deep ocean vents where magma or lava is coming out of the earth. And we don't have light available and other things, but from what's coming out of the earth, we have hydrogen sulfide gas. That's what this H2S is. And they can actually use that as their energy source. I would imagine an area like this smells a lot like rotten eggs. So this is all critical for most ecosystems and they're, that there's a producer trophic level. So without those organisms, energy wouldn't be available for everybody else in the other levels above them, and then life would not be possible. So another one is heterotrophs who acquire energy through the consumption and digestion of other living or previously living organisms. Huh. And so these things can be measured. Gross primary productivity is the rate at which photosynthetic producers incorporate energy from the sun. Not all of the energy is incorporated by producers, is available to the other organisms in the food web, because producers need to grow themselves, and they need to reproduce, and they need to consume energy. So again, only a certain amount then goes to our next level, as we've been stating before. Then the net primary productivity is the energy that remains after the producers are done with what they need. And uh, so the net primary productivity is what's available to all the rest of the organisms in their, their feeding um, food web and uh, food chains. So gross primary productivity, it's like your full paycheck, the full amount of energy that photosynthetic organisms take from the sun, but net is actually the energy you get to take home, right? In like a paycheck, if you compare it to those things. Here's an example of swimming shrimp and some lobsters and hundreds of vent mussels that are seen at the hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the ocean where no sunlight penetrates. And thank goodness for the chemoautotrophic bacteria that live there. This was taken in 2006. Biomagnification. This is an unfortunate consequence of being at the top level of your food chain. As top level consumers feed on the lower trophic levels, they receive 100% of the toxin in each organism they eat. So biomagnification is the increasing concentration of persistent toxic substances and organisms at each successive trophic level. These substances, these toxins, are usually fat-soluble, not water-soluble, and are stored in the fat reserves of each organism. This is a process called bioaccumulation as well, that these toxins don't just flush through you, they actually accumulate in you. So uh, many substances that have been shown to do this, biomagnify, include a very nasty pesticide called DDT, and also uh, toxins called PCBs, polychlorinated biophenols, or biphenols. Um, these are used in coolant liquids in the U.S. and were banned in 1979, and also heavy metals like mercury, lead, and cadmium. So unfortunately, um, as energy flows through an ecosystem, it's a bunch is lost at each level, but with toxins, 
you don't lose any at each level. You transfer 100% of whatever toxin is in the lower levels is 100% transferred to our upper levels. And so remember our bald eagles, how as our national bird, we should be completely protecting them, right? We almost made them go extinct with using DDT. It accumulated in their body tissues and interfered with their ability to make eggs. It made their eggshells really, really um, not strong, really fragile. So their reproduction rate went way down, as did their population, and they were very endangered. Now they're coming back as we've banned this DDT and don't use it anymore. This is one thing to remember as humans can be top level consumers, that when you eat fish from a lake, however many fish you eat, 100% of the mercury in those fish is transferring to you completely and those can bioaccumulate in your tissues. That's why you might see warnings at certain bodies of water that tell you to only consume fish from that body of water only ever so often so that you don't have toxic levels of these materials accumulating in you. We can see that shown again here of PCB concentrations increasing as we go from the phytoplankton and zebra mussels up to our apex predator, the walleye. Notice that our higher trophic levels accumulate more PCBs than the lower ones. And if you like to eat walleye, that means that you're the next level up and you're consuming 100% of those PCBs that are in that walleye. What about nutrients? Energy flows through an ecosystem, but nutrients cycle. I always like to think of that uh, energy flows and nutrients cycle. Nutrients need to be recycled to be available for the next generation. Whatever we have on earth is what we have available. So we, right, we have to recycle it and uh, use it again and again. So decomposers are best friends who can help take those nutrients and return them to the soil so that they can be available to the ecosystem once again. These include organisms like fungi and bacteria. So the six most common elements associated with the organic molecules that make us are carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And they take a variety of different chemical forms as they move through uh, different systems, living systems, and through the earth. Geologic processes like weathering and erosion, water drainage, and subduction of the continental plates can play a role in the cycling of these elements on earth. And remember, organisms need these elements because these are elements that make up different components of our bodies. Like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen making up our lipids and our carbohydrates. Those plus phosphorus making up our DNA. And the, those plus the nitrogen and the sulfur, which we can find in our proteins. So we need these elements very badly and we need them to be cycled through. We can't just let them sit tied up in organisms forever. We have to make them available again to our environment for others to use. There's only a finite amount of stuff available to us here on Earth. So because geology and chemistry have major roles in the study of the process of the recycling of inorganic, inorganic matter between living organisms and their non-living environment, these are called bio geo chemical cycles. Bio for living and geo, that they're part of earth and chemical cycle, biogeochemical cycles. So again, nutrients cycle around and through the decomposers. So our nutrients move from the soil to the producers to the consumers and the decomposers put all of that back into the soil for the producers to once again get a hold of and make available to every trophic level above them. So our motto is energy flows, 
nutrient cycle. Energy flows through an ecosystem. Thank goodness we have our sun as our ultimate source of energy providing that for us because obviously at each level there's loss of that energy, but we still have our sun to keep feeding energy back to our trophic levels, to our food chains and our food webs. Uh, but the nutrients must cycle. We only have, again, a finite amount of stuff here on Earth for us. And our decomposers are our friends who will help cycle that stuff through. So energy flows, nutrient cycle. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. That's why energy, or that's why uh, nutrients must cycle through. So let's start with our first biogeochemical cycle, the water cycle. The hydrosphere is the area of the earth where water movement and storage occurs. The various processes that occur during the cycling of water include evaporation and sublimation, condensation, precipitation, subsurface water flow, surface runoff and snow melt, and stream flow. Water from the land and oceans will enter the atmosphere by evaporation or sublimation. It'll condense then into clouds and then fall as snow or rain types of precipitation. Precipitated water then can enter freshwater bodies or infiltrate into the soil, become part of groundwater again, which is a major storage area of fresh water and the cycle completes again when surface or groundwater re-enters the ocean and evaporation occurs. So here's some numbers for you. Salt water makes up 97.5 percent of our earth and fresh water is just this small chunk little in tan right there which is why we really need to take care of our fresh water. It's only 2.5% of the water we find on Earth. So of that 2.5%, only 0.3% is lakes and rivers. Groundwater, including soil moisture, swamp water, and permafrost is about 30.8% of this small chunk. And glaciers and permanent snow cover, 68.9%. And uh, the pursuit of drinkable water has been an ongoing problem throughout human history and the supply of fresh water continues to be a problem even in modern times as well. So again we have to protect this small 2.5 percent chunk. So I like to look at uh, the water cycle in this way. The abiotic reservoir of, of water, abiotic meaning the uh, living storage area of it, is surface and atmospheric water. It enters the food chain with precipitation and plant uptake. It's recycled by transpiration. That's where trees and other plants release it into the atmosphere through their leaves. And then it's returned to the abiotic uh, reservoir with evaporation and runoff. So that's a good way to look at the water cycle. Another thing to uh, remember is that trees and plants are also an important part of the water cycle. As we cut more and more of them down, that's also going to affect our water cycle. Here's an idea of what transpiration is. Where we have the uptake of water from the ground into the tree and it's released into the atmosphere. It's important to preserve our plant life on Earth. They are part of the water cycle and water, fresh water, is something that every living thing here on Earth needs. Cutting down trees breaks the water cycle and can lead to deforestation, which then that can lead to desertification as we cut down trees, then the topsoil that's very nutrient rich is washed away and basically you create deserts where nothing can grow and you reduce the amount of precipitation in the long run 
And this is what's happening right now, especially as we cut down our uh, tropical rainforests. Let's look at the carbon cycle. Carbon is our fourth most abundant element in living organisms. It's present in all organic molecules, including DNA, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Its role in the structure of macromolecules that I just read off is of primary importance to all living organisms. Carbon compounds contain energy, and many of these compounds from plants and algae have remained stored as fossilized carbon, which humans can use as fuel. So carbon dioxide gas exists in the atmosphere and is dissolved in water. So we could say that's our abiotic reservoir of carbon. Photosynthesis can bring in carbon dioxide gas into the producer and they'll change it to an organic carbon such as sugar. Then cell respiration can cycle that organic carbon by burning that sugar, send that carbon back as carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere. The long-term storage of organic carbon occurs when matter from living organisms is buried deep underground and becomes fossilized, such as fossil fuels. Volcanic activity and more recently, the human emissions by using these fossil fuels can bring that stored carbon back into the carbon cycle. There's the biological carbon cycle with organisms like producers pulling that carbon out of the air through photosynthesis, making sugars so that organisms can do cell respiration and put the carbon back into the air as carbon dioxide. That's the biological carbon cycle. The biogeochemical cycle of carbon when it's stored as fossil fuels or when it's dissolved, carbon dioxide is dissolved in ocean water. So again, I like to think of this, our abiotic reservoir of carbon is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, also sometimes dissolved carbon dioxide in water. It enters the food chain through photosynthesis, through carbon fixation, that's what it's called when a producer grabs carbon dioxide out of the air and it fixes that carbon into other organic molecules through a process called the Kelvin cycle during photosynthesis. And then returns to our, it's recycled with cell respiration. Forgot to write that one in there. And then return to the abiotic through respiration and combustion, combustion of fossil fuels. There's also when organisms die, they contain carbon and decomposers again help to recycle that carbon back to the, the ecosystem. If you're interested, the Crash Course Biology on YouTube, or sometimes called the SciShow, really does a nice job of discussing these cycles, the, both the water cycle and the carbon cycle, and any of the material that we talk about. If you look it up on YouTube for Crash Course, uh, they do an awesome job discussing these things as well. The nitrogen cycle. Proteins contain nitrogen. So all living things require nitrogen organisms will crowd around wherever there's nitrogen available because all organisms need to build proteins and proteins contain nitrogen. Nitrogen enters living systems by nitrogen fixation and it's eventually converted from organic nitrogen back to nitrogen gas by bacteria. That occurs in three steps on terrestrial ecosystems called ammonification, nitrification, and denitrification. So producers are not able to grab nitrogen out of the air. Even though the air has about like 70 some percent nitrogen, it's there, it exists as N3, 
And so it's all around us. It's kind of like dangling a carrot or candy in front of us, and we can't do anything. We can breathe it in, but it doesn't do anything because that N3, those uh, three nitrogens tied together, it's by very strong uh, triple covalent bond. Very strong to break that triple covalent bond to get it broken apart into the individual nitri nitrogen elements that we need. So we can't do it. Um, actually, producers cannot do it. So who can do it for us? Well, it turns out it takes a very special type of bacteria to do it for us called nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Also, lightning can do it. That just kind of tells you how much energy is needed to break that triple covalent bond in nitrogen. So lightning and nitrogen-fixing bacteria can grab it out of the atmosphere. So the nitrogen and nitrogenous waste from animals is processed back into gaseous nitrogen by soil bacteria, which also supply terrestrial food webs and the organic nitrogen they need. So here we go again. Our abiotic reservoir is nitrogen in the atmosphere, but remember it's just there and we can't do anything to get it, so we rely on our other organisms to get it for us. It enters the food chain by nitrogen fixation, by different types of nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil and water, living at, uh, often live at the roots of certain uh, organisms like we see here as little nodules in this picture. It's recycled by decomposing and nitrifying bacteria and returns to the abiotic by denitrifying bacteria. Again, the SciShow on YouTube does a great job of explaining this as well, if you need a little more tutorial on it. The phosphorus cycle. So phosphorus is important to us because we have a lot of phosphorus in our DNA, in our cell membranes. So we definitely need phosphorus. Phosphorus is tied up in rocks and soil. So basically, the weathering of rocks, water runoff, helps to dissolve the phosphorus for us and then makes it available to producers, which then makes it available to us. Also, volcanic activity can release phos oops, phosphate into the soil, water, and air and become available to us. And uh, phosphate enters the oceans and surface runoff, groundwater flow, and river flow. Phosphate dissolved in ocean water cycles into marine food webs, and some phosphate from the marine food webs falls to the ocean floor where it forms sediments. It becomes a abiotic reservoir, right? So here's our chart once again. The abiotic reservoir of phosphorus is rocks, minerals, and soil. It enters the food chain by erosion that releases these soluble phosphates and then is taken up by plants and other producers. It's recycled by decomposing bacteria and fungi and is returned to the abiotic by loss to ocean sediments. And in your notes, there's those links to the SciShow for those cycles. Now there's a problem. Can there ever be too many nutrients? too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus? And the answer is yes. Excess nitrogen and phosphorus causes eutrophication, a process where there's too many nutrients that run off into bodies of water, and then that causes an overgrowth of, growth of algae, because algae love nitrogen and phosphorus because they can use it to build proteins and DNA and other things. So they will grow and kind of make an algae sheet over the water. As those algae die, it takes up oxygen and takes away oxygen from the body of water. And there's organisms like fish who need that oxygen in that body of water. And you can have things like fish kills occur due to eutrophication. So why is this a problem? It's human-caused uh, fertilizers. When we apply fertilizers, which contain nitrogen and phosphorus, to our lawns and then it rains, 
that rain carries those nutrients into our bodies of water, into our wetlands, our lakes, our rivers, and our streams and ponds. And just like I said, then it causes an overgrowth of algae, which then, when they die, depletes oxygen and then kills the living things in that body of water who need that oxygen. Algae can also block light from other organisms that are in the water. So this creates what's called dead zones, and we can see where a lot of those occur. And a lot of times it's places where there's a high population density and we have a lot of people who are using phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizers. This show, the satellite image shows the Chesapeake Bay affected by eutrophication. And we've got an Army Corps of Engineer holding up a clump of oysters being used as part of an oyster restoration effort at the bay. There's also a sulfur cycle, as sulfur is in our top list of six important elements for us. We can find sulfur in our proteins. In fact, sulfur is a part of the amino acid methionine, which is the first amino acid in all proteins. Cysteine is another amino acid that contains sulfur. So sulfur dioxide from the atmosphere becomes available to terrestrial and marine ecosystems when it's, evol or di when it's dissolved in precipitation as weak sulfuric acid and, or when it falls directly to earth as fallout. Weathering of rocks can make sulfates available to terrestrial ecosystems and deposition of living organisms can return or decomposition of living organisms uh, return sulfates to the ocean, soil, and atmosphere. So the sulfur dioxide that enters our atmosphere enters by decomposition of organic molecules from volcanic activity and geothermal vents and also from the burning of fossil fuels that humans do. All of that is part of the sulfur cycle. We should mention that human activities play a major role in altering the global sulfur cycle. The burning of large quantities of fossil fuels and releasing those gases into the atmosphere and then having rainfall can create acid rain, which then decreases the pH of our bodies of water. Acid rain can be corrosive. And uh, so some examples that are mentioned in the book is that many of our marble monuments, like the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., have significant damage from acid rain over the years and shows examples of the wide-ranging effects of human activities on our environment and gives us more challenges to figure out for our future. Here's a sulfur vent in California. Sulfur generally you can see with yellow. All right, in the last couple sections of our chapter, we're going to take a look at some specific biomes. Earth's biomes can be either terrestrial based on land or aquatic which would include both ocean and freshwater biomes. There's eight major terrestrial biomes on Earth and are distinguished by characteristic temperatures and amount of precipitation. Annual totals and fluctuations of precipitation affect the kinds of vegetation and animal life that can exist in broad geographical regions. Temperature variation on a daily and seasonal basis is also important for predicting the geographic distribution of a biome where it can be located. And since biomes are defined by climate, the same biome can actually occur in geographically distinct areas on Earth with similar climates. So there are large areas on Antarctica, Greenland, and in mountain ranges that are covered by permanent glaciers and support very little life, and they're not considered biomes. And in addition to extremes of cold, they're often deserts with very low precipitation. So a map of our Earth can show us where our biomes are located. Our eight major biomes. 
which are characteristic with their temperatures and amount of precipitation. The green is the tropical forest or tropical rainforest. Notice those are mostly by the equator. The boreal forest in kind of a yellow. Savanna in kind of a tan, like the African savanna. The tundra in kind of an orangish red, up more by the, the caps, polar caps. Deserts in kind of a brown, like the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. Mountains, which are in purple. Chaparral in kind of a blue, kind of a darker blue. Polar ice, such as right here, kind of an ice color. Temperate forest, such as here. Notice Minnesota is right there, temperate forest, and also near the temperate grassland. Uh, Minnesota is interesting in that it's kind of a meeting point of three major biomes. Then I found another picture to uh, depict that as well. So here's our terrestrial biomes listed. Tropical rainforests, or sometimes just called um, rainforests. Savannas, deserts, chaparral, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, boreal forests, and arctic tundra. Tropical rainforests tend to have a high biodiversity because of their large amount of plant life and producers. Lots of rain, lots of sunlight, usually warm with many plants and many uh, animals, some of the most diverse, diverse places on earth. This is the Madre de Dios in Peru near the Amazon River. Sometimes these are referred to as wet forests, found mostly by the equator. Sometimes tropical rainforests have been described as nature's pharmacy because of all the diversity of organisms there. There could be potential for finding new drugs that are hidden within the organisms and the chemicals that those organisms produce. The vegetation is characterized by plants with spreading roots and broad leaves that fall off throughout the year. And these are year-round forests. The temperature and sunlight profiles here are stable in comparison to other terrestrial biomes with average temperatures between 20 degrees Celsius to 34 degrees Celsius. That's 68 Fahrenheit to 93 Fahrenheit. So our month-to-month -month temperatures are relatively constant here. So that lack of temperature seasonality, like what we have, it leads to year-round plant growth rather than seasonal growth, which we might find in other ecosystems or other biomes. The rainfall average range is about um, 250 to 450 centimeters. So that's up to... Uh, 14.8 feet a year. They have wet months and uh, they also might have dry months as well. Their trees with many leaves can create a canopy above which can create competition for light for other organisms that live below that canopy. An extensive tropical Dry rainforests can occur in Africa and Madagascar, India, southern Mexico, and South America. So it's one of my favorite biomes because of the diversity of organisms that can live in these places. Then there's savannas, another biome. This one is in Australia. Other savannas include the African savanna as well. They are basically grasslands with scattered trees. They can be kind of hot and tropical at times, have a decent amount of rain, but they may also have dry seasons and uh, consequent fires as well. Sometimes there's a relatively few trees and more grasses. And since 
fire is an important source of disturbance in this biome. Plants have evolved well, developed root systems that allow them to quickly re-sprout after a fire. They tend to have my, uh, middle of the road biodiversity and may have a lot of herbivores. Subtropical deserts like this, the desert here in uh, Big Bend National Park in Texas, may appear only after rainfall and then they're shed, these desert plants. And I am going to breeze through some of these biomes because uh, one of your labsters that you will be doing will uh, have you become more familiar with the different biomes. Deserts tend to be areas of low biodiversity, very dry and hot in the day and cold at night. Very few plants, only small animals, reptiles, insects, rodents, and birds. Chaparral, dominated by shrubs. Sometimes chaparral is called a scrub forest. Can be found, uh, there's one in California, and also along the Mediterranean Sea and the southern coast of Australia. Rainfall may be between 25.6 and 29.5 inches per year with their major rainfall in the winter. Summers can be very dry and some of the plants even become dormant during the summertime due, due to the lack of rain. You'll find a lot of shrubs there and their uh, adaptations to periodic fires there as well. Some of the plants producing seeds that would germinate only after a hot fire goes through. The ashes that are left behind leave a lot of nitrogen available for regrowth. Fire is a natural part of the maintenance of this biome and other ones as well, but then can frequently threaten the human uh, habitation that may go there. Temperate grasslands, you can be familiar with those. So we have those in the United States known as our American prairies. Found along North uh, America, also in Eurasia there's some. They have pronounced annual fluctuations in temperature with hot summers and cold winters. Don't we know it living around this area around Minnesota? They have specific growing seasons for plants and in the winters when it gets cold, those plants may go dormant. Precipitation is between 10 and 35 inches a year. They may have few trees, but those trees could be growing more along rivers and streams where there's greater water sources. And dominant vegetation is going to be your grasses, hence they're called prairies as well. The uh, treeless condition is maintained by low precipitation, frequent fires, and grazing by herbivores. The vegetation can be very dense and the soils can be very fertile because of the grasses that grow and die there. And fires again be, are a natural disturbance here. When fires are suppressed in temperate grasslands, the vegetation eventually converts to scrub or dense forests. Often the restoration or management of temperate grasslands requires the use of controlled burns to suppress the growth of trees and maintain the grasses that live there. Here's a temperate grassland in the Midwest. We tend to have middle of the road biodiversity here with dry and wet seasons, cold and Cold winters, hot summers, frequent fires in dry seasons, and many herbivores. Not as many trees, but lots of grasses. Temperate forests, sometimes also called deciduous forests. We should be familiar with those as well as we have that around here in Minnesota. They're the most common biome in North America, in Eastern North America, Western Europe, Eastern Asia, Chile, and New Zealand. It's found through the mid-latitude regions. Temperatures are between negative 22 Fahrenheit and 86 Fahrenheit. Can drop to freezing on an annual basis though, and 
can have growing seasons with the different seasons. Precipitation is pretty constant throughout the year and is between 29.5 to 59 inches a year. Deciduous trees are the dominant plant in this biome. There may be some evergreen conifers. Those deciduous trees would lose their leaves and go dormant in the winter. Therefore, there would be little uh, photosynthesis during the winter months, but each spring, as we know, the uh, green reappears and photosynthesis commences once again and other life commences again. These uh, forests show less diversity of tree species than tropical rainforests. And our temperate forests have rich inorganic and organic nutrients in the soil due to the falling leaf litter each year. The leaf litter can protect from soil erosion and can insulate the ground for other things that live there during the winter. Here's a temperate deciduous forest known for a higher biodiversity with seasonality, cold and uh, warm seasons, and many different forms of mammals, insects, birds, etc. But less with the diversity of trees, but they have a lot of trees, but less diversity of trees than the tropical rainforests. The boreal forests, or taiga, you'll have to travel more north in uh, Minnesota towards Canada to see this, it has low-lying plants and conifer trees. It can also be called a coniferous forest found between the 50 degree to 60 degree north latitude across most of Canada, Alaska, Russia, and Northern Europe. Found above a certain elevation and below certain elevations where trees can't grow. Mountain ranges throughout the Northern Hemisphere. This biome can have cold and dry winters, short, cool, wet summers, and an average precipitation between 15 to 39 inches which the precipitation then, because of the uh, temperature, can take the form of snow, then with little evaporation because of the cold temperatures. They uh, have longer winters, colder winters, so therefore have a lot of cold, tolerant, cone-bearing plants, like evergreen coniferous trees, pine, spruce, and fir, with their needle-shaped leaves. Evergreen trees can photosynthesize earlier in the spring than deciduous trees because less energy is required to warm the needle, needle-like leaf than a broad leaf. And evergreen trees can grow faster than deciduous trees in this type of forest. The soils tend to be a little more acidic with less amount of nitrogen available. And coniferous trees that retain nitrogen-rich needles in a nitrogen-limiting environment may have a competition advantage over broadleaf deciduous trees that might want to try to grow there. The net primary productivity of these forests is lower than that of the temperature or temperate forests and the tropical wet forests. Here's a coniferous forest, mid-diversity, drier, cooler, lots of evergreens, but still a variety of animals. The Arctic tundra. North of the sub-Arctic boreal forests and located through the Arctic regions of the Northern Hemisphere. It exists at elevations above the tree line on mountains. The average winter temperature is negative 29 degrees Fahrenheit, a little chilly. Average summer, summer temperature is between 37 Fahrenheit to 52. So it doesn't warm up very much there. They can have short growing seasons of 50 to 60 days only. However, because of their location on Earth, there may be times where there's 24 hours of daylight. 
So the plant's producers can receive 24 hours of sunlight there. So plant growth can be rapid. The uh, amount of precipitation is about 6 to 10 inches with little variation on that. Plants here are generally low to the ground like low shrubs, grasses, and lichens and small flowering plants. There's little species diversity, low net primary productivity, and low above ground biomass. And the soils tend to have what's called the permafrost and kind of be in a, a state of permanent frozenness. So organisms that live there must be adapted very well to that. Again, tundra low biodiversity. Here you may find migrating animals that go there during the growing season and then go further south to the other forests for the winter cold season. There's also, those were terrestrial biomes, there's aquatic and marine biomes, which these aquatic biomes are very much influenced by abiotic factors like light temperature, flow regime, and dissolved solids that are in the water. There will be a depth at which the sunlight can't reach in these biomes, so the importance of light is central to the communities of organisms that live there because of sunlight there's only so much productivity when there's not a lot of it solar radiation can also warm the bodies of water therefore these biomes can exhibit exhibit distinct layers of water uh, differing temperatures water temperature affects the organism's rate of growth and the amount of dissolved oxygen available for respiration movement of water can be an issue also and organisms need to be adapted to constant movement, like if they live in a river. All of this natural water contains dissolved solids and salts. They'll be influenced by that as well. Aquatic habitats can have an interface of where marine and freshwater ecosystems meet. So there can be complex and variable salt environments here, and these are known as brackish water environments. Lakes located in closed drainage basins can concentrate salt in their waters and can have extremely high salt content. Therefore, species that live there need to be adapted to these environments. The ocean is a continuous body of salt water and is relatively uniform in chemical composition. There's a weak solution of mineral salts and decayed biological matter there. Within the ocean, there's coral reefs. Those are a second type of marine biome. There's estuaries, coastal areas where salt water and freshwater mix, which forms a third unique marine biome. The ocean is categorized by several zones, such as the open water, referred to as the pelagic zone, the benthic realm, or zone, extends along the ocean bottom from the shoreline to the deepest parts of the ocean floor. From the surface to the bottom, or to the limit which photosynthesis occurs, so only going so far down as much as light penetrates is the photic zone. And at depths greater than 200 meters, sometimes light can't penetrate, therefore that's the aphotic zone. The majority of the ocean is aphotic and lacks sufficient light for photosynthesis. The deepest part of the ocean, the Challenger Deep, is about 11,000 meters or 6.8 miles deep. So to give some perspective on the depth of that trench, again this is the Mariana Trench located in the western Pacific Ocean. Um, the average is 14,000 feet deep. That's pretty deep. Marine environments tend to have high biodiversity, especially where light can penetrate. The coral reef has lots of light for a lot of biodiversity. The inner tidal zone, lots of nutrients. And the benthos in the deep ocean where 
Possibly light doesn't penetrate as much, may have a little less diversity. So here's a diagram of our different zones to make it a little more visual for you. All of this, the open water is the pelagic zone or realm, the photo zone or photic zone where light can penetrate, the aphotic zone where light does not penetrate with their depths, and the abyssal zone. Here's an example of an intertidal zone from Alaska and a coral reef with coral who are animals that uh, secrete calcium carbonate and then build upon that year by year to make the great coral reefs that are there, places where organisms can swim in and amongst. Cnidarians are things like jellyfish and anemones and coral. Here's an estuary where fresh water and salt water meet in uh, California. Mixing of these waters creates what's called brackish water. They can have a lot of crustaceans, mollusks, and fish, but of course salinity or salt content would be a major thing that influences whether organisms can live there or not. They need to have adaptations to exist there. Once or twice a day, high tides can bring salt water into the estuary. Low tides can reverse the current of salt water. So there's a daily mixing that occurs here. So mussels and clams tend to have a, quite a bit of those that live there. Some can even switch from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration. So interesting organisms that live in estuaries. There's freshwater biomes, maybe what we're a little more um, in contact with here in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, which actually it's more lakes than that. They include lakes, ponds, and wetlands, which are standing water, as well as rivers and streams, which are flowing water. So obviously organisms living in either of those have to have adaptations to either the standing water or the flowing water. And humans really rely on these freshwater biomes to give us drinking water, crop irrigation, sanitation, recreation even, and industry. So these roles that these freshwater biomes provide for us, that well, many things that ecosystems provide for us, these are called ecosystem services. We have to respect the ecosystem services that are provided for us that we can't live without. Therefore, we must preserve our ecosystems. Lakes and ponds are found in terrestrial landscapes and are therefore connected with abiotic and biotic factors that influence those terrestrial biomes. Here we have a uh, waterway with uncontrolled algae growth. This might look familiar. You may see something like this around where you live. Um, like in Minnesota, you need to think about lakes uh, that during one part of the season, they're going to be warmer. During another part of the season, their top will be frozen over during the winter. Organisms must be uh, adapted to that. When uh, the spring melt occurs, there's going to be a mixing. You may find certain strata of temperatures depending on how deep the lake is. And because of runoff, there could be uh, more nitrogen and phosphorus than what should be, and eutrophication can be an issue. Rivers. Rivers can range from narrow and shallow to wide and slow moving. So rivers and the narrow streams that feed into rivers are continually moving and carry water from the source or headwater to the mouth at a lake or the ocean. The largest rivers include the Nile River in Africa, the Amazon River in South America, and the Mississippi River in North America. Abiotic features along the length of the river can have an impact. And streams begin at a point called the source water. 
The source water is usually cold, low in nutrients and clear. And then the channel, the, the width of the river or stream is narrower. Headwater streams are of necessity at higher elevations than the mouth of the river that often originate in regions with steep grades leading to higher flow rates than lower elevation stretches in the river. Faster moving water and short and the short distance from its origin results in minimal silt levels in the headwater streams. Therefore, water can be more clear in photosynthesis attributed to algae that are growing on rocks. There can be phytoplankton, and there could be some tree cover around these bodies of water as well. Wetlands. This is uh, Florida Everglades. Wetlands are environments which the soil is either permanently or periodically saturated with water. They're a little different from lakes and ponds because they exhibit near continuous cover of emergent vegetation. Emergent vegetation consists of wetland plants that are rooted in the soil but have portions of leaves, stems, and flowers extending above the water surface. So there's several types of wetlands including marshes, swamps, bogs, mud flats, and salt marshes as well. Oops, I hit the wrong button there. Freshwater marshes and swamps can have slow and steady water flow. Bogs can develop in depressions where water flow is low or non-existent. There could be clay at the bottom with poor percolation. That's the movement of water through pores in the soil or rocks. And water in bogs can become stagnant and oxygen depleted. Nitrogen can be a limiting resource, uh, but in some places where runoff occurs can also have eutrophication in those areas. Some types of bog plants can be sundews, pitcher plants, and venus flytraps, and can capture insects and get their nitrogen that way. Bogs tend to have a low net primary productivity. All right, like I said, I kind of grazed through those biomes pretty quickly because there's a labster that you'll be doing that does some of the uh, biomes and be helps you become more familiar with those. So as usual, I I've reached the end of the chapter. Um, this was kind of a long one with a lot of slides due to the different biomes that we went over. Um, but uh, as always, I recommend looking at the end of the chapter questions, which they are in the book, and I've also pasted here in this area as well. And again, if you have any questions, let me know. We'll see you next time.